That's hello year nine. So today we are back with stage four of the Christmas Carol. As always, we're starting with a retrieval quiz. So if you follow the link in the middle of the screen, if you are on PowerPoint, if you're on PDF, you can of course copy and paste the link into your web browser. If you're on YouTube, simply follow the link in the description below this video clip. Right, our overview for today's session. Now we are, as previously, on stage four. We're on part four of stage four today. And our challenge, which hopefully everyone can achieve, is to explore character and narrative development in stage four, particularly important in terms of Scrooge. But hopefully a lot of you will also push further into evaluating Dickens' use of structure and language. So pushing it into that sense of what's he trying to do, how does he achieve it, and so on and so forth. Now for a starter, we've got a, an information retrieval task. So on the right-hand side, you've got a section of text which is all about um, how Christmas Carol has been interpreted over time, uh, how views of it have changed, the impact that it has uh, had, and so on and so forth. And the idea is you're going to try and pick out six details about the impact and interpretation of the Christmas Carol over time. Now, if you are writing on a copy of this PowerPoint, if you haven't printed out, you can, of course, write in those six boxes provided. If not, you can, of course, simply make notes. Uh, there's six details. There's plenty to find. Give yourself about five minutes on that. Press play again when you've had a chance to complete it. And I'll run through some ideas that you may have picked out. Right, things you may have wanted to focus on. Um, there is that detail about Dickens advocating a humanitarian focus uh, of the holiday. So there is essentially Christmas being focused on looking after people, looking out for people. There's that detail about um, the lasting impact in terms of family gatherings, seasonal food and drink, dancing, games, and festive generosity of spirit and reconciliation. In actual fact, you could have those separately. So family gatherings could be one, seasonal food and drink could be one, uh, dancing and games could be one, a festive generosity of spirit and reconciliation could be one. Um, so already so far, that's you know, four or five you could have. Um, there's the rise of charitable giving in Britain. That's details you could have uh, in 1844. You've got some specific examples of that. So there's Robert Louis Stevenson vowing to give generously to those in need. Uh, that's one. Thomas Carlyle hosting two Christmas dinners uh, after reading the book. That's one as well. Uh, you've got the American businessman, this wonderful, wonderful little anecdote um, about being, him being so moved by attending a reading that he closed his factory and sent every employee a turkey, which is a beautiful detail. So that's one. Uh, the Queen of Norway sending gifts to London strip crippled children, signed with love, with Sally Tim with love. Um, that's quite a nice one as well. Uh, you've got the idea of audiences viewing the tale as a spiritual but secular parable. That's one. Uh, the idea of it becoming a children's story in the early 20th century. That's another detail. Uh, you've got the um, increasing centralisation of Cratchit within the story uh, in terms of the economic depression. That's one as well. You've also got this detail at the end there about Scrooge sometimes being portrayed as like a Freudian figure wrestling with his past and the influence of his past and the legacy of those things. So in actual fact, there's about uh, 12 to 15 different details you could have. You just need six of them. But they're all relevant in terms of the text itself, the impact that it's had. Um, and these are all bits of the context which do sort of help to shape how we view the text and its legacy. A familiar slide. Narrative summary. So, of course, it starts with a summary of the extract we read in our last session together when we looked at um, stage four, part three. And, of course, you've got a quick summary as well of stage four, part four, uh, to help set up what we're doing today. As always, if it's useful, read it, uh, you know, find out what's going to happen. And if it's not useful, feel free to ignore it and get on with the text. And it's absolutely fine as well. Right, that brings us to our extract for today. First bit of it we've got on the left-hand side, and it's Scrooge, of course, being alone with the dead body. Um, and on the right-hand side, in the yellow box, we have, of course, our four prompts. We've got narrative, language, imagery, and character. As ever, the idea is that you read through the extract, you look at the prompt questions, and you annotate the extract based on those prompts. And again, as ever, if you have the text in front of you, write all over that. If not, you can, of course, write all over this as a handout or a printout, if you have that in front of you. And if neither of those things apply, simply make notes in your exercise book or your notebook, and that works equally well. When you've had a chance to do that, if you press play again on the audio, I will run through a few ideas that you may want to consider. Well, let's start with this first one, the narrative. Why is the spirit offering Scrooge this lonely, isolated moment with the corpse. Well, there's a few things going on here. So for one thing, um, it's relevant that he's, lone, he's alone and lonely and isolated with the corpse, which is all those things as well. 
because it links, of course, to the way he is living his life, the fact that he is isolated, but also deliberately isolating himself from other people. It's also emphasising the importance of the need for reflection. There is one path to where Scrooge's life is, is heading, and it is to the, where you know, the, the scene in front of him, to this image of his dead body, alone, unmourned, uncared for, etc., silent and empty, with only you know, the sounds of um, you know, uh, a cat's tearing at the door, the sound of noise and rats beneath the hearthstone. Um, you know, the, only, the only purpose this body now serves is to be devoured. And that's that moment that Scrooge is having to have, that realisation of ultimately, this is what it comes to, just that physical thing on the bed. Number two, then, language, the significance of Scrooge learning the lesson, do you think? So we have this phrase, um, Spirit, he said, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson, trust me. Well, lesson, of course, yes, we think of education, we think of learning something, obviously. But learning also takes us back to Scrooge's childhood and those ideas about um, in learning, where we acquire our behaviours from. It links us back to the idea of Scrooge being, yes, someone who as an adult has some pretty reprehensible, rather, you know, rather unpleasant views of the world. But the obliviousness and the borderline you know, bigotry that he exhibits when he's an adult is all based on his childhood experiences. And these things that he was taught as a child, you know, he was taught to be alone, he was taught to be isolated, um, he was taught not to be able to engage with people. You know, these are all lessons he was taught by his circumstance, by his context, and particularly by his father. And of course, what he needed was a different lesson to learn. He's returned to the state of being a child. He's accepting the authority of others over him. He's accepting that there are things he needs to learn. You know, he's returning to this innocent state um, and acquiring new knowledge as a result, hence the lesson. And that also links forwards then, of course, to uh, stage five, this idea of him being you know, the, the schoolboy reference um, when he's you know, being, being excited. Um, Three, then, imagery. Symbolism of the ghost pointing silently at the head of Scrooge not having the power of Scrooge not finishing his redemption. Well, the symbolism of the ghost pointing silently at the head, it does a few things. For one thing, if we think of what the head is, the head is, of course, the seat of thought. It is the seat of speech, the seat of communication. It's about eyes and sight and sensory details. These are all the things that Scrooge needs to engage in order to actually achieve the redemption um, that he's on the path towards. The head is also, um, you know, we're defining the person. You know, we think of a person's face as being something that very much distinguishes and identifies them in, as an individual. And that is, of course, what Scrooge needs to engage with. But he's unable to see it. He's too scared to see that. And that sense of having the fear, but not the willingness, not the bravery um, to confront his fear is also part of it. And that links back to that sense of, you know, why is Scrooge alone? And part of that is about um, his fear of judgment, his fear of failure, his fear of rejection, and that sort of thing. And of course the ghost is silent, and the head is silent, because the head is dead, it's just a dead person. And of course the spirit itself represents the future, both in terms of the silence of the grave, and the inability to communicate with the grave, uh, despite all those Victorian ideas about you know, spiritualism and so on. Um, but also the unknowability and the indefinability of the future as well. The idea of Scrooge not having the power is interesting as well, because part of the recognition Scrooge needs to have is that he is not as controlling and controlled as he believes himself to be at the start of the novel. He sees himself as being someone who is powerful and in control of his own life. And this recognition of a higher power on every level is important, this acceptance of his own weakness. But he doesn't have the power, of course, because he hasn't completed the process. And the process itself is empowering him. Um, and Scrooge not yet finishing his redemption. Well, it is this idea of until he can actually fully engage with the idea of his eventual death and the end of that, you know, that causal process, that chain of events that will lead to his death, um, he isn't ready to actually be redeemed. Character then, how do you describe Scrooge's emotional state here and why is it relevant? Well, he, you know, he feels weak and powerless, obviously, as we've just said. But also further than that, we have this idea of um, when he says, if there's any person in the town who feels emotion caused by this man's death, said Scrooge, quite agonised, show me that person, to, show that person to me, spirit, I beseech you. Well, agonised, he's actually emotionally, psychologically in pain here, um, you know, at the horror, really, of being confronted by death, and really the, the type of death this person has endured, and the circumstances surrounding it. 
So Scrooge is, is, is in pain here, and that's important. He needs to feel it um, in order to change. And he feels, of course, fear. He feels weakness and powerless. Um, he feels in pain. But also this idea of showing that person speaking spirit, I beseech you. He's begging the spirit for help. He's begging the spirit to do something for him. And that sense of the reciprocity of, you know, we do things for other people because they need it, people do things for us because we need it. So that sense of that social interaction, that social dynamic, that social infrastructure is important because that is how society works. And that is, of course, what Scrooge, as I said to himself, got. So it is relevant. It goes very much to the heart of Scrooge's character and the heart of what Dickens is, is trying to say to us. Right, next is the extract, and this is a find the evidence task. So left-hand side, we have these five statements. You can find evidence for in the text. And on the right-hand side, you have the next part of the extract. And it's a young couple, of course, with the deck. So have a read through, annotate in whatever format and in whatever way you are doing it. Uh, find evidence for those five things. Don't forget, as ever, they are in the right order, which should help you. When, you, when, you, when you've done that, so if you press play, and I'll run through some ideas. Right, let's start with this first one. Darkness is linked to negativity, fear and death, light to positivity and life. But we go from this scene with Scrooge, you know, agonised, uh, in pain, beseeching the spirit. It spread its dark robe before him for a moment like a wing. Then we see a room by daylight with her mother uh, and her children. So we go from a room of death and darkness to a room of daylight and life. We have a mother and her children. Um, so this is very much the, the kind of idea of you know, death to life, age to youth, that kind of idea. Second one, the woman feels stressed, anxious, possibly excited. Well, we have this reference to um, anxious eagerness we have there, and starting every sound, uh, and so on. You know, when there's long expected knock, she hurried to the door, and it also shows a sense of you know, excitement, eagerness, something along those lines. Number three, poverty is viewed as ageing people. Well, when her husband arrives, um, he's described as a man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. So even though he's young, there is a sense of um, he's been aged by his circumstance. Number four, then, the couple have retained their sense of morality and spirituality, despite their awful circumstances. Well, there's a couple of bits for here. Um, one is where it says um, he appeared embarrassed how to answer. So he feels almost guilty that he's taking pleasure in the death of someone. And that's interesting from a moral point of view, the fact that he feels it's, it's, it's immoral or unworthy of him to celebrate death. And there we have the, the good or bad part. But we also have this idea of um, when, in the last paragraph, she was a mild and patient creature as her face spoke truth, but she was thankful in her soul to hear it. And she said so with clasped hands. She had prayed forgiveness the next moment and was sorry to the first of the emotion of her heart. So despite the fact they feel grateful for the man's death, there is still a sense of guilt about it. And we have this idea of the, you know, um, praying forgiveness the next moment and was sorry. She feels bad that she was grateful, despite that she was. We have an emotional response, and then that spiritual moral response afterwards, which they've retained. So rather than these you know, semi-feral, um, criminal, poor people that um, Scrooge was describing in uh, stage one, and that in fact, you know, the ideas of Thomas Malthus and those uh, Victorian economists. You know, what we have here is very much this, this kind of idea that despite their poverty, there is a sense of morality, spirituality, and almost a spiritual purity about these people that the bankers very much lack, and Scrooge and Marley very much lack. Number five, then, Dickens links the poverty and suffering of the semantic field of religion. Not a hard one to spot this one. So in terms of um, you know, words with religion, we have, of course, um, truth, uh, that's one. We have the idea of soul, clasped hands, the idea of linking it to prayer. We have prayed, of course, forgiveness. Um, you know, lots of words there to do with, with religion um, running through that. Right, we're on our bigger question for today. Final bit of the extract on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have our bigger question. The yellow box. What is the message of this scene intended to be for Scrooge? And how is that message conveyed by Dickens here? And then it's green box. How does the family here compare to the Cratchits from earlier in the novel? Have a read through, reflect, decide what you think about those um, those two questions, and then press play, and I'll have a quick you know, discussion about how we can interpret this. Right, okay. So the message of the scene. Um, it's an interesting one. We go from a scene in which you know we have the dead body which was unmourned, um, you know, picked over by 
people such as Mrs. Dilber and, and, and the others, um, and possibly even devoured by you know, the rat, the cat, etc. And there is a link, of course, between those, those two things. But we shift from the sense of it, you know, nobody caring, of being no interest or value to anyone, to actually a scene where it is meaningful, it is valuable, um, but in the opposite way that perhaps Scrooge expected. He expected some emotion um, linked to the death, to be someone grieving, someone feeling sad that this person had died. Whereas in actual fact, the only feeling is gratitude, happiness, uh, relief. So what is worse than dying unmourned uh, with no one caring? What's worse than that is, of course, this, uh, to die and for people to be relieved that you are dead. It also links, of course, to the idea of um, the impact that it's possible for us to have on people's lives. Um, these people, of course, their lives could have been transformed by a single action on the part of the dead man. You know, that his death, of course, has had a good impact. Um, whereas, in actual fact, you know, he could have been a person to have that impact during his life, um, to help them you know, sleep tonight with light hearts, um, soften it as they would, their hearts were lighter. So light, lighter, and again, that image of um, light, brightness, um, you know, a lack of weight, and so on. It goes back, of course, you know, to light and dark in stage one, to the sort of Christmas past in stage uh, two, and you know, all those other occasions where we've seen it. And we had the of the children being happy, the children's faces hushed and clustered around to hear what they saw and understood were brighter, a happier house. So we have children as well, you know, the people to whom Dickens is, is very sympathetic, but also that we see sympathy for on the part of Scrooge. You know, he feels sorry for his younger son, of course he does. He feels sadly by Fan and her death, of course. But when we are in stage three, um, Scrooge does feel sad, of course, for Tiny Tim. He feels sad for ignorance and want. Scrooge does actually feel um, sympathetically engaged with, with, with children. And the fact these children have been made happy by something so awful um, is, of course, you know, key to that as well. It's also worth thinking about, of course, the idea of death, the, 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 the man dying, um, but also the future, then, in terms of life and living, and that comes through children. And it's children such as these, children such as ignorance and want, and children such as Tiny Tim. And that sense of the change that you make is not just for your benefit, it is the long-term impact it can have for people such as these. Um, how does family here compare to the Cratchits from earlier in the novel? Well, the simple version really is, isn't it, that it, it's almost as if, if the Cratchits got into debt, this is who they would be. You know, a couple who are happy, loving, moral, good people, hard-working people, um, the people who need you know, the rest of society to look out for them, to care for them, to protect them, um, you know, to, to serve them, I suppose, to, to that kind of like Christmas um, servant ideal. Right, a task now to try and draw things together a bit. Now, we're on stage four. I think we are quite a decent way through stage four, in actual fact. So I'd like to try and, try and pin down from the four stages that we've read so far. What are the factors that have happened in each stage that have led Scrooge to his current situation? So what are the things throughout his life, the choices that he has made, that have led him to where he is now? In stage one, for example, there are three um, bullet points. We have his refusal to engage with Fred. That is a key one. Has he engaged with Fred? Have he agreed to go to his house? Have he tried to um, you know, look on Fred as some sort of uncle figure, which he is, that he would not be where he is now? Um, chasing away the carol singer. Has he shown that young person some sort of sympathy, some sense of response? Um, even not, ag not wishing to think aggressively, then he would not be here now. This is a negative thing, you know, the, um, the cruel treatment of children, essentially. His unsympathetic treatment of Bob regarding Christmas uh, was a key thing as well. So in stage one, of course, we have his actions, and those others we can have there as well. Stage two, of course, gives us the past. What are the things in the past that have led him to where he is? Stage three, of course, we have some ideas about his current context, his current situation, um, what are those things? Um, and the stage four as well, uh, things that have led him to this point. And we see them through, of course, you know, examples like the one we have just looked at. Now, there isn't necessarily a right answer to this, but do try and pin down in each stage what are these steps in this chain that have led him to the point he's at now, where his death will be not just unmourned, but possibly cause for celebration. And that brings us to our theme room. In a quick fire recap, so on the screen you have seven questions uh, to do with, largely to do with the text we've read today, with a few links backwards. Uh, lots of those seven questions also have some bonus questions attached to them as well. 
So have a quick run through those. Uh, you can either write down answers if that's useful, or simply do them in your head. That's absolutely fine as well. When you've had a chance to work out what you think the answers are, press play again on the audio, and I'll run through some possible responses. Right, the first one, before Dickens' time, Christmas celebration was associated with all the countryside and peasant revels, is the basic answer. Bonus, the view of Christmas that Dickens offers, uh, in contrast, is about kind of an urban season of uh, an urban festival of, you know, of, 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 of giving and generosity and collective experience and so on. So it is, it is a clear contrast. Number two, following the publication of the novel, there was a marked increase in charitable giving. Let's know more. Bonus with specific examples, including well, Robert Louis Stevenson was one, Thomas Carlyle, uh, there's American businessman, you know, the Turkeys, etc. Number three, original audiences would have interpreted the novel as being um, both spiritual and secular is a key one, and as a religious allegory, obviously. Bonus, the novel has, however, been reinterpreted over time, um, such as in the, well, the early 20th century, when it became viewed as a children's story, or in terms of the American Depression, when it became you know, an allegory about um, Bob Cratchit um, and the, you know, the, the plight of the working man, etc. Number four, the scene with Mrs. Dilber, Joe and the others is, inclined, is included to show. Well, the uh, aftermath of Scrooge's death is, is the key thing, really. Uh, the lack of care, but also the corruptive, damaging influence that people such as Scrooge have on society. They make the world a worse place. Um, and there's a parallel, of course, between those characters and the rats and the cats gnawing around the dead body. Number five, Dickens has Scrooge, uh, sorry, Dickens has Scrooge shown the dead body in order to. To emphasise the isolation of it and the loneliness and the solitude of it and the lack of sympathy and care, etc. And to confront him, of course, with the reality of his, of, of, of his own death, if he chooses to see the face, but he doesn't. Bonus, when we see the body, Dickens emphasises the sadness of the scene as a result of well, the isolation of it, the loneliness, the silence, the solitude. Number six, Scrooge insists that he has learnt his lesson, but he asks to see, uh, well, he asks to see some emotion associated with the death. As a result, the spirit shows Scrooge um, the young couple and their family who are pleased that he is dead. Uh, kind of bonus number two, they're happy because well, he's dead, but that gives us that gives them rather longer to pay back the money that they owe. Number seven, as a result of this, Scrooge at the end of the section asks to see some tenderness associated with a death. And that brings us full circle back to our overview. Now, obviously, we've gone through uh, Stay 4, Part 4 today, so hopefully all of you will feel you've achieved the challenge, which was to explore the character, sorry, character and narrative development in that part of the text. But hopefully a lot of you will also feel you've pushed further into that aspire outcome, which is to evaluate Dickens' use of structure and language uh, in that part of Stay 4. Thank you very much for your time today. Hopefully that's been useful, and I will see you in our next session together.